Hello everyone, this is Umar Arun Malik. Well, I welcome you all on behalf of Apex and CBPA to EMDP session number three. Uh, well, for today's session, the main presenter is Mr. Farooq Gurban. Mr. Gurban has uh, over 10 years of experience uh, in the system operations and market operations. Um, he has been a dispatcher. He, his expertise is very relevant uh, for today's session, which is about economic optimization of power systems. And you will see that uh, uh, he brings a lot of experience onto the table. He has delivered such lectures uh, in the past also to a larger audience. So I hope so that you will enjoy it with the session. You will learn a lot from him. Well, uh, something about some words about Apex. Apex uh, is an association of power exchanges and market operators uh, from all across the globe. Uh, we have over 45 members. Uh, and thanks to Apex and the collaboration of Apex and CPPA, we are delivering this EMTP session for all of you. Well, a few words about uh, the EMP, EMP training calendar, what we have done already. So we are in, on to session number three. Uh, we are right here. We have already covered you know, setting the perspective and you know, power sector supply chain. Uh, in the first session, we have covered you know, very high level concepts about electricity markets. We did discuss the market architecture, market structure, and then we compared and contrasted several countries and their market designs and why they are different and we discussed their design features, but that was a very high level view, I would say, a bird's eye view of things. And then we went into session number two, and we did a deep dive into uh, load generation and ancillary services. In load, we discussed several detailed things such as, uh, you know, how the different load profiles, their physical characteristics, load duration curves, uh, certain important indices such as coincidence, coincidence factors, load, uh, uh, load factors, and how, you know, uh, the different characteristics of different loads as well. And then we went into generation, we discussed the technical, physical, and financial aspects of generations of uh, different technologies. Uh, and finally, we discussed with uh, a few examples the ancillary services that what are ancillary services, how they are produced, and how they are compensated as well. Uh, so I would like to say here that uh, this session two, three, and four are making a foundation for session number five. Uh, which is in December, which uh, will be on uh, electricity markets. We'll go into complex electricity markets and we'll discuss some further details. So here they're building the fundamentals, starting from load, then generation, some words about ancillary services. Today, we are going to discuss economic optimization of our system. And mainly, uh, we will uh, discuss the different horizons from short, medium to long term, or you can say operations to new capacity additional horizons. Uh, Mr. Kurban will tell you the details about the session today. We will make it interesting for you by doing some examples. I'll talk about that in a bit. And then the next session, please mark this date, uh, which is on 27th of November. Uh, another very important session in which we will discuss transmission. We'll, we'll start with a very simple concept of transmission. And then when we will build into some complex and intricate concepts such as angular stability and voltage stability and for you know their role in limiting the transmission uh, capability or transfer capacity. Uh, this session will also have some time spent on the demand side management, and then we'll go into our main core area, which is electricity competitive electricity markets. Well, before I uh, relay to Farooq Urban so that he can start session number three formally, uh, we move on to the next slide, and I want to highlight a few important things to you. So this is a slide that you presented in the orientation session, and it has some important points. So let me uh, emphasize them to you again. Number one is about the session time today. Today, the session will try to uh, complete this in two and a half hours with 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A session at the end. It depends upon your number of questions. You know, we can even make it longer, the last half an hour. So we'll try to finish this by in within three hours. Uh, today, there will be no quizzes. Well, that's, that's a good news for you. Uh, but we have ex made two exercises for you that will you do on the Google Classroom. So uh, you will see those assignments coming in in your Google Classroom. Uh, each participant will be given about 10 minutes or, or so to complete them, and they will be graded as well. Uh, we will give you a discussion uh, post, you know, for, for the discussion forum or individual assignment after the session ends by the end of this week. Uh, important note about grading: grading you everything that you submit, your quizzes, your exercises will be graded. Uh, as we said earlier, that we are sharing the average and means with all of you, and we are keeping your individual scores uh, 
confidential. For the first two sessions, we will share all the details of your discussion forum, your scores uh, by the end of this week. So uh, please wait by the end of this week to get your discussion forum scores as well. Uh, well, this is, uh, I wanted to highlight here that your certificate is not dependent upon your grade. It is dependent upon your participation. So your participation of six out of eight sessions is mandatory to get a certificate unless otherwise you uh, communicate to us in writing that there was a special circumstance and you were unable to attend a session uh, and you, you can do it online. I mean, we, we have, will have the videos recorded for you. So, but that would be a very special, extraordinary circumstance that you need to communicate to us. And as a course director, I need to prove it. And then you, you can, you know, yeah, get that provision. Uh, finally, over on the certificate, because we are internally grading your quiz assignments and everything. So the people who have at least six, attended six sessions, and they are in the first 10 top tier, uh, first 10 people who, of the participants who have the highest score. So they will be getting uh, a certificate from Apex. Everybody will be getting a participation certificate, but these guys will be getting a certificate which will be with distinction by them. So those people who are, who are working hard, keep it up. And uh, you, so you, you will get something you know, special for you. We have something special for you waiting there. So with this, uh, I would like to say goodbye. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, thank you very much for keeping, you know, for you are there for, with us for last three months and we have five more months to go. Uh, and we look forward to, uh, you know, work with you in future and collaborate with you inshallah. In the future. Thank you very much. And I'll now let uh, Mr. Farooq Urban to come and deliver session number three. Thanks a lot. Hello and good afternoon everybody. So welcome to our lecture series of EMTP and today we'll be discussing the economic optimization of power systems. Before we start today's session, let's have a quick recap from our generation technology session in the last month. We studied that the generation technologies can be broadly classified as hydro generators and among thermal categories there are steam turbines, gas turbines, DG sets and we have the VRE categories with wind and PV cells. Now these categories based on the fuel type can be further classified into different categories, including hydro as a rare reservoir based or a runoff river plant, a thermal generator being a coal fired, a gas fired, or a nuclear or fuel oil fired power plant, and renewables include wind, solar, and biomass. Let's discuss some of the important performance metrics of the thermal generation units. An important feature of many generation technologies is the thermal efficiency of a unit which is given as a ratio of energy output to the energy input. Theoretically, the maximum value for thermal efficiency is 100% since the energy output cannot be more than the energy input. However, in practical terms, the rates of thermal efficiency for newly installed power plants typically range from 20% to 65% depending upon the technology. Higher efficiency saves on fuel cost and reduces the quantity of pollutants produced per unit of electricity generated. Recent advances in the materials and fabrications have made it possible to design PC units to operate at higher steam temperature and pressure, which raises their efficiency. So at the moment, the new subcritical PC plants have thermal efficiencies in the range of 33 to 37%, supercritical PC plants with an efficiency range of 37 to 40, and ultra supercritical, supercritical plants with efficiencies of 44 to 46%. Gas-fired combustion turbines achieve energy conversion efficiency ranging between 20 to 35 percent and natural gas combined cycle units usually operate with thermal efficiencies between 50 to 60 percent. Recent improvements in turbine materials and technologies have enabled efficiency improvements up to 65 percent. For many purposes, it is useful to invert the efficiency ratio and report the amount of energy input required to produce a unit of electricity output which is called the heat rate and is given as a ratio of the energy input to the energy output. Uh, we need to be careful that while calculating the heat rate, we must take care about the units that we employ. While thermal efficiency is a unitless measure, heat rates are generally reported using different units for the energy input in the numerator and energy output in the denominator. This is emphasized by the equation that is shown on the screens for calculation of heat rate. Now, in much of the world where SI units are used, the heat rate is typically reported in kilojoules in the numerator and kilowatt hours in the denominator. However, in some places, 
um, heat rate is reported in kilocalories in the numerator and kilowatt hours in the denominator. In the US and other places where British imperial system of unit is still used, a heat rate is typically reported with BTUs in the numerator and kilowatt hours in the denominator. Therefore, to translate from thermal efficiency to heat rate, we not only invert the ratio, but we also multiply by the conversion factor appropriate to the units that we use for energy input. For example, in the systems where thermal efficiency is represented in BTUs, this multiplying conversion factor is 3412 and the heat rate of a plant is given as the ratio of 3412 to the thermal efficiency of the power plant. Capacity factor is a widely used metric for the performance of an electric generator uh, and is given as a ratio of the electricity produced in a given period to the total capacity of production for the same period. It is as shown on the screens. Another important metric is the availability factor uh, which is the ratio of the amount of the time when a generating unit is available to produce electricity to the total amount of time in the period. It is given as the equation shown on your screen. Now with this quick background and a recap of our last session, let's start today's session that is on the economic optimization of the power system and we'll be going through the outline as shown on the screen. After completing today's session, we should be able to describe a supply stack and explain the typical role of each type of electrical generator in the supply stack. We'll be discussing about the unit commitment in in an ideal world and imposing certain constraints on the overall operations of the power system. We'll summarize the process of unit commitment and explain the impact of different type of dispatch constraints on the unit commitment process. We'll be describing the resource adequacy and planning reserve margins and relate these concepts to the decision to invest in the new generation capacity. We'll try to define, interpret and calculate the levelized cost of electricity and apply this concept on the decision of making incremental generation capacity in the power system. Let's start with the introduction of our today's session. We'll be discussing primarily on the three horizons or domains of the power system optimization. That is capacity investment, unit commitment, and generator dispatch. Capacity dis investment asks about how much generation do we want to build and of which type in the grid. Do we need to have more renewables or we need more peaking capacity that depends on the type of the load curve of any given system. Unit commitment accepts the capacity as given and plans to meet the demand for days of the week or hours of the week, keeping in view the available capacity, nature of capacity, our maintenance outages, ramp rates of different techn generation technologies and such kind of parameters. And then finally, the generator dispatch. It accepts the unit commitment decisions as given and decides which of the available units should produce the power at any particular hour or the next hour. The time horizons are even smaller in this decision making. It can be either minutes ahead or hours. Now, the nature of each of these problems is universal and each problem is same in different countries and across the regions of the globe regardless of how they have organized the electricity industry. Some of the countries, they rely on competitive wholesale markets and other rely on a rate of return regulated investor owned utilities, while other rely on state owned companies or corporations. Many countries have a mix of these different institutions. So regardless of the particular institutional structure or the legal framework, the three problems facing the institutions are the same and the economic principles underlying the problems are the same. So in this session, we'll get these common underlying principles. So the sequence of our today's session will be that we'll be first discussing the generation dispatch, <clears throat> in which we'll be discussing about uh, supply stack, the marginal operating cost of different generating units and the system, and what is the impact of congestion on the dispatch decisions. Then we will be discussing unit commitments, applying certain kind of dispatch constraints on the dispatch decisions and then the ancillary services. Finally, we'll be discussing the investment decisions of uh, resource adequacy and planning reserve margins in the power grid. What is the levelized cost of electricity and a portfolio of different generation type of capacity. Let's start with generator dispatch. The simplest model of generation dispatch starts with the construction of a supply, supply stack. The figure shown on the screen is based on the system of the power sector of Pakistan 
having an average load of around 22,000 megawatts and the peak load around 30,000 megawatts. Uh, the horizontal axis on the supply stack is the quantity of power generated expressed here in megawatt. The vertical axis is the marginal cost per unit of electricity, which in this case is measured as rupees per kilowatt hours. <coughs> The marginal cost here is the marginal operating cost which takes longer run factors like capacity investment and unit commitment as given. The stack is like a supply curve. Generation units with the lowest marginal operating cost are the points further left on the stack and those with the higher are the points on the right of the stack. This ranking is also known as merit order in certain regions. So for any given cost level, the stack shows the amount of cumulative generation that can be produced from units with the marginal operating cost below that level. Or looked at the other way around, for any given amount of generation, the stack shows the marginal operating cost of the last megawatt of generation needed. The table on the screen shows an excerpt of the calculations made to construct the stack. The full table lists around 400 different generating units, including wind farms, solar farms, hydro generators, nuclear plants, coal-fired generators, and various natural gas-fired generators, including combined cycles and steam turbine units, and the combustion turbine, as well as some other units. The table is sorted from the lowest marginal cost generator to the highest marginal cost generator. So uh, the third column of the table shows each unit's marginal cost. And you can see that the wind farm has the lowest marginal cost among those shown in the table, while the combined cycle unit has the highest marginal cost among those shown here in the table. The fourth column of the table shows the capacity of each of these generation units. And the fifth column shows the cumulative capacity of the stack up to and including that unit. That is the cumulative of all the units with the lower marginal cost plus the capacity of this unit. As you can see here at serial number 18 for Punjab Thermal Power Plant, which is a combined cycle unit fired on the RLNG, the cumulative capacity equals the cumulative capacity of all generators up to and including the wind generator. Unit number or plant number 18 plus the capacity of all the units, the total totals around 23,000 megawatts. The supply stack shown here in this figure is a graph of the third and fifth column of the tables that we have just seen. The supply stack is used by intersecting it with the demand curve. In the electricity industry, where much or all of the demand is price inelastic, the demand curve is sometimes simplified to a vertical line representing the forecasted load. Here in figure, it shows two different lines representing two different load levels. One line that is at a forecasted load of around 22,000 megawatt represents the average load on the system. And the other is around 30,000 megawatt, which represents the peak load. The average load line intersects the supply stack at a marginal cost of around 12 rupees, or you can say 14 rupees per unit of electricity. If the load on a given hour matches this average, then all of the units to the left of this load should be dispatched. They have the lowest marginal cost to provide the needed power and the marginal cost of delivering the last megawatt of power at this load level is around 14 rupees a kilowatt hours. Generating units to the right of the average load line have the marginal cost higher than 14 rupees per kilowatt hours and they will be idle at this point in time. Similarly, the peak loan line intersects the supply stack at around 30,000 megawatts and the marginal cost of supplying this power is around 30 rupees a unit. So at the, at the peak load levels, all the generating units to the left of this point will be dispatched and all on the right side of the supply stack will be idle in this given time. This model of dispatch has a very simple on-off structure where most of the generators are either on and producing up to their capacity or they are completely off. At most, one generator is producing below its capacity. This generator is known as the marginal generator. For example, look at this table and we consider that the load at any given point is around 16,000 megawatts. This is greater than the cumulative capacity of the unit um, up to unit number five. 
Therefore, the units up to this unit will be on and producing at their maximum capacity and unit number 5 will also be on but not producing up to its maximum because the load is lower than the cumulative capacity of, include, of the capacity including this generator. So unit number 6 will be the marginal unit. The term system lambda is used for the marginal operating cost of the last megawatt hours of power generated in any given hour. This is also called the system marginal cost. So in the supply stack that we have just seen, the system marginal cost of unit number 6 uh, that is uh, 3.1 rupees per kilowatt hours is the system lambda in case the demand is around 16,000 megawatts. So in another hour where the, where the load matches the peak of around 30,000 megawatts, the system lambda will be around 32 rupees per kilowatt hours. So the, the system lambda actually fluctuates with the load reflecting the load marginal cost of meeting small off-peak loads and the higher marginal cost of meeting the large and peak loads. Since load varies with time of the day and day of the week and the season of the year, so does the system lambda. The supply stack that we, uh, that we are seeing on the screens is built under the simplifying assumption that every generating unit has a constant marginal operating cost. Therefore, each generating unit could be ranked by that. It is this simplifying assumption that gave us the simple on of structure and we can extend the model on more complicated cases in which some of the generating units have a marginal operating cost that increases with the output. When we do, constructing the supply stack is a little more complicated. Right, so let's, let's extend our unit commitment problem by imposing a simple constraint of the increasing marginal operating cost of the generating units. The figures on your, screen, on your screens shows a fictional horse pair system with each of its two generating units uh, attached to the each bus and having an increasing marginal cost given by the equations as shown here. Um, the QA and QV in the equation, they represent the quantity of electricity that is generated by each of the generators at connected at each bus. Alpha A, alpha D and beta A, beta E are the coefficients of the equation. Now with this given equation, the graphs of increasing marginal cost of each unit as a function of its, gener of its generation is shown on the screens. The marginal operating cost for both the systems, they start out at around uh, $5 per megawatt hours. And as the level of generation increases, the marginal cost of unit A grows much slower than the marginal cost of the generating unit B. Right, so because of the cost structures uh, that we have seen in uh, for, for both generators in the last table, for any given level of the system generation, which is represented as the sum of uh, generation at bus A and bus B, it will make more sense for the generation unit at bus A to produce more than the generation unit at bus B. The lowest cost dispatch sets the marginal operating cost of the generation at the two units equal to one another. So uh, equating both the equations with the parameters as given for both generators, we will find that uh, the unit at bus number A will have to generate three times more that, than what unit B generates so that the overall marginal cost of the system grows at the lowest possible cost. Uh, in other words, we can say that the generating unit A generates three-fourth of the total generation while the unit at uh, bus number B will generate one-fourth of the total demand. So this figure shows that uh, the total marginal operating cost, which is increasing slower compared to both of uh, the individual cost of the generating units. Now given the optimal dispatch across the two units, we can calculate the system marginal cost for any level of the total generation needed. This is the line shown by the total marginal operating cost of, of the system with this line. We see that the marginal operating cost of the system climbs more slowly than the marginal operating cost of providing the same output from any single generator unit, including the lowest cost generator. So the system marginal cost curve is also the supply stack, taking into account the increasing marginal cost of each generator. Now continuing our example of the dispatch, um, let's put on another constraint on the overall uh, dispatch system. Well, uh, the simple supply stack for the region uh, aggregates all of the available generation capacity and all of the load without regard to where the capacity and load may be located. The implicit assumption is that 
any generator in the system can serve the load anywhere in the system. This ignores the transmission constraints. It may happen that the cheapest generators are located on one side of the system and that a large fraction of the load is on the other side of the system and that the capacity of the transmission system between the two sides is less than the power to be delivered. In that case, congestion on the transmission system prevents us from fully utilizing the cheapest generators and more expensive generation will have to be dispatched to cover the shortfall. This raises the cost of generation. The simple supply stack model that we have discussed just now gives us the lowest cost of unconstrained dispatch, but we must find the lowest cost constrained dispatch. Now looking again at the figure of our uh, Lahore square system, we see that all of the load is located at bus P. Now it can be served by generator B without needing the using of the transmission line, but can only be served by generator A in so far as the line has sufficient capacity. Suppose for a moment that the transmission line has a maximum capacity of 300 megawatts. Now in this case, we need to revise our calculation of how the total generation will be divided between units A and unit B to take into account this transmission constraint. So long as the load is below 400 megawatt, it can be served by the optimal combination of generation from the two units as we calculated since the, unit, the unconstrained optimal generation from unit A is 300 megawatts or less. However, any load above 400 megawatt must be served exclusively from unit B. This is the constrained dispatch and as shown by the dotted line in the figures on your screen. Uh, this shows that how we revise our calculation of the system marginal cost to take into account this transmission constraint and the resulting constrained dispatch. Now let's do an example for our uh, Lahore square system um, and uh, you are required to tell the dispatch level of both generators uh, in the hour when the load is 200 megawatt and in the hour when the load is 450. Please remind that uh, we will be solving this problem with uh, the transmission congestion imposed on the system. Um, so 10 minutes and once you are done, please uh, paste your solutions in the Google Classroom, the link of which has been given in the chat box. Uh, and once you are done, we will try to solve the problem together once we are back. Right, so we hope that you would have done the exercise. Now if we recall from our calculations, uh, the optimal solution to meet the load was such that the generation from unit number A will have to be three times the generation from unit number B. In that case, in order to meet a load of 200 megawatts, we, the optimal solution is that unit A produces 150 megawatt and unit B produces 50 megawatt so that the load can be met at the least possible cost. Now in case of a uh, situation when the load is 450 megawatt, ideally the dispatch would have to be from unit number A equals to 337 megawatts and rest to be met from generator B. But if we recall that the transmission constraint in our example restricts generator A to produce anything beyond 300 megawatts. Therefore, with our transmission constraint, the degeneration from unit number A would be 300 megawatts and remaining 150 megawatt will have to be produced by generator B. So in case of a constrained dispatch, the optimal solution would be that generator A produces 300 megawatts and generator B produces 150 to meet the load in the system with the given transmission constraints of the grid. We are now going to start uh, the next topic and I think it's a good time to have uh, a coffee break. So everybody, let's have a 15 minutes coffee break. Let's get ourselves refreshed and we start with the next topic. Let's discuss about second part of our session that is unit commitment. The discussion of dispatch we have been doing in the first part ignores some important considerations. For example, it assumes that all generators are always available, whereas in fact, generators are sometimes offline for maintenance and therefore unavailable for dispatch. Most of this maintenance is planned, so the generator is choosing when to be available and when to be unavailable. That is a unit commitment decision. 
The obvious choice is to schedule the maintenance for some time when load is low and the capacity is not urgently needed. In a market, that would be when the price of electricity is forecasted to be low. In a system with many generators, the maintenance will be staggered so that sufficient capacity is always available to meet the required load. Scheduling maintenance is a simple version of the unit commitment problem. The more complicated version is the daily decision forced by the important dispatch constraints on the operation of individual generator that we ignored in our earlier discussion of dispatch. We now turn to the discussion of those constraints. So while making uh, a dispatch or a unit commitment decision, each type of generation technology has its specific set of constraints. For example, some of the important constraints on the steam turbine power plants include the startup time, the startup cost, minimum generation and the ramping constraints, cycling costs, minimum downtime, and etc. Now, if we briefly discuss about some of these constraints, so uh, in startup time, because of these uh, startup time constraints, so even if uh, at, again, at any given time, even if the marginal operating cost is low, unless an earlier decision had been taken to bring them online, they are not immediately available. The startup time required varies depending upon the equipment as well as upon the state of the startup. Equipment that has cooled down fully from the last use will take longer to start up. About the startup costs, the discussion that we have been doing rank generators according to their marginal operating costs. However, many generators have a fixed cost of starting up, which also needs to be taken into account. Even when their marginal operating cost for a single hour looks low, it may not make sense to turn them if they are only going to operate for that one hour because the hour's revenue will not recover the startup cost. On the other hand, if they are likely to operate for many hours in a row and thereby recover the startup cost, it may make sense to turn them on. A minimum generation, in addition to a maximum capacity, many thermal units have a minimum level of generation below which they cannot stably operate. So this kind of constraint has also to be honored. Ramping constraints, uh, the discussion about other constraints assumes that uh, load fluctuates up and down. Uh, each generator's dispatch can be adjusted up and down. However, individual generators often have technical constraints on how quickly they can ramp up and on how quickly they can ramp down. If the load increases very quickly, the cheapest generators as ranked by the marginal operating cost may not be able to ramp up that fast and the system may need to briefly use more expensive and faster ramping generators. So ramping costs, so um, even when a generator technically could ramp up fast enough, the owner may not want to because the ramping generator up and down quickly stresses the equipment and shortens the operating life, which is an important added cost not included in the usual calculation of marginal operating cost that we have been discussing in the last session. So um, cycling costs, so uh, similar to other kind of constraints, turning a generator on and off frequently stresses the equipment and shortens its operating life. Some generators may prefer to temporarily operate at a loss in order to avoid the costly consequences of cycling the equipment. Uh, then another constraint is the minimum downtime. So some units once taken down must remain down for a minimum amount of time. Um, other than the, the, the constraints that we have just discussed about uh, steam turbine power plants, there are other type of uh, generating units which have some of these or have similar kind of uh, constraints arising out of their particular design. For example, uh, modern natural gas combined cycle plants can operate in different configurations, each of which is optimal for different levels of operation. And each configuration has different minimum and maximum capacity levels. Uh, there are constraints on moving from one configuration to another that is, uh, that is generally called as reconfiguration constraint. And certain configurations make it easier to quickly ramp up, whereas uh, other configurations limit the ability to ramp. Now, moving from one configuration to another has a cost, much as the startup cost of certain units has a cost, uh, and this is typically called as a reconfiguration constraint. Now, um, considering all these kind of constraints, in order to fully optimize the system, <clears throat> daily and hourly decisions must be made uh, about which units to start up and which to shut down. The system operators must also decide the configuration in which certain generating units should be placed. Once these unit commitment decisions are made, they constrain the subsequent dispatch decisions. Therefore, the unit commitment decision needs to look beyond the cheapest way to meet the current hours level of load. Optimizing requires a careful analysis of how load is likely to evolve over several hours. 
For example, it is only worthwhile paying the startup cost for a unit if it is likely to operate for several, several hours in a row. And it is only worthwhile shutting down a unit if it is not going to be required again the very next hour. Now, when there are constraints of these sorts on individual units, the system marginal cost has a complicated structure, uh, unlike what we have been discussing in our first part of the, of the session. Uh, now, the figures shown here, uh, they show the system marginal costs that increase continuously and gradually. In both cases, in our examples that we did in the first part, it was assumed that every generating unit could operate anywhere between zero megawatt and its maximum output. There was no minimum loads or other complicating constraints like those that we have just discussed. Now let's do an example uh, with an illustration to, to uh, dispatch or make a unit commitment decision in a complicated system with the marginal cost function that arises when the generating unit has a minimum and a maximum load level. Uh, the table in, on your screens, it shows the basic data for making this kind of decision. And let's do a dispatch decision in the system with these two generators for a load level that varies from 260 to 305 megawatts, and we will see the costs. Well, so uh, table on the screens, it shows us uh, the basic cost structure for the two generator systems in the case example that we are going to solve. It shows here that uh, unit A can operate anywhere between 0 and 275 megawatts. Uh, so essentially, it has no minimum stable, stable level constraint. Uh, and uh, uh, it has a, a marginal operating cost of $25 per megawatts for a load level between 0 to 150 megawatts. Similarly, for the load levels between 150 to 250, the marginal cost is $30. And uh, for the load levels above 250, it operates at, an, at a cost of $40 per megawatt hours. Uh, for unit B, we see that it can operate anywhere between 60 and 100. So essentially, it has a minimum stable level constraint of uh, 60 megawatts. So it cannot operate be uh, below 60 megawatts. Uh, and each megawatt uh, produced by generator B has a marginal operating cost of $45 per megawatt. Now, uh, here we see that uh, how the dispatch changes with different load levels. So essentially, uh, the efficient dispatch of system for the load between 260 to 305 megawatt uh, is that the unit A is always the cheapest unit to dispatch. However, once the load exceeds this uh, 275 megawatt mark, it is necessary to also dispatch unit B because for the loads just above 275 megawatt, um, ideally the system operator would like to use unit B just to supply the incremental needed above 275. However, because of this uh, minimum stable level constraint on unit B, the dispatch of generator A must be scaled back. Now, when the system load increases from 275 to 280, unit A dispatch, we see that it declines from 275 to 220 megawatts. If the load increases further beyond 275 or uh, essentially 280, unit A will be the first one to be to serve the increasing generation. Uh, table here on the screens, uh, it shows us the total operating cost of each, each generator and its specific dispatch level as well as the total cost. So in the final column, uh, it shows the marginal cost or most precisely it shows uh, the delta per megawatt hours change in the total cost of making a dispatch decision in, in this example from 260 to 305 megawatt. Now, uh, constraints like these that we have just discussed uh, these make it very complicated to solve the optimal unit dispatch. They also make it very complicated to speak simply and clearly about uh, the system marginal costs. However, um, how important these complexities are depends on the system and the constraints that are imposed in the overall dispatch decision and unit commitment. Many analysts uh, discuss system operations and system marginal cost as if they worked according to the simpler framework that we have been discussing in the last part. Uh, effectively ignoring or assuming uh, away the complexities. However, they have in the back of their mind these complexities and are aware that uh, under certain circumstances, these may need to be incorporated into the discussion. System operators responsible for daily unit commitment and dispatch develop programs and algorithms capable of handling these type of complexities. Generators uh, responsible for contracting, bidding, and optimizing their individual plant operations uh, they are also aware of these complexities and how the system operators, programs, and algorithms uh, are handled therein. Um, now, the, these uh, unit commitment decisions, they happen at different time scales and interact with the calendar patterns of the load. 
uh, there are daily and weekly unit commitment decisions that involve deciding which of the available units should be turned on and at what level or in what configuration uh, given the anticipated load over the coming uh, hours, day or week. And then there are uh, seasonal unit commitment decisions that involve deciding when to take a unit offline for maintenance and other needed actions. Uh, for example, most nuclear reactors, they need to be taken offline in the order of, to refuel. Uh, and it makes sense to do this during the season of the year when the load is at its lowest, um, like uh, typically in the spring or fall uh, for the countries with uh, strong heating and cooling demand in the winters and summers. Um, now, before we conclude our unit commitment discussion, uh, one important consideration in, in this uh, process is the provision of uh, ancillary services or the reserves requirement in the overall dispatch decisions. In the last session, we discussed the importance of several services that generators can provide to help uh, assure the security of system. Um, these include regulation, operating reserves, and voltage support. And generators need to be carefully managed in order to be able to provide these kind of services. Uh, for example, in order to provide a regulation um, or reserves, the generators must be up and running and synchronized to the system. And it must be under the control of the system operator so that adjustments can be made um, quickly. Uh, in order to provide operating reserves, the generators cannot already be um, operating at its maximum capacity. They are, uh, it, it needs to have certain unused capacity. And then depending upon the speed with which the reserves are needed, the generator must be in a condition to meet the specified needs within the specified time limits. Uh, again, uh, connecting from our last session, uh, there are certain configurations in which voltage support in the form of extra reactive power is also available and cheap. Uh, and in other configurations it, in which uh, providing extra reactive power requires cutting back on the delivery of active power or is impossible altogether. Therefore, a unit that claims to be available to provide voltage support must be appropriately configured. So the optimal unit commitment decision must also take into account the need for these kind of ancillary services. Uh, all right, welcome back. Now let's start with the, the last part of today's session, and that is about the capacity investments and uh, resource adequacy. Well, um, both the dispatch and unit commitment discussions that we uh, have been discussing in the last two parts are very short horizon decisions uh, about how to utilize the generation capacity at hand. Uh, at longer horizons, a decision has to be made about how much capacity to install and what type of capacity it should be. Uh, now, this, uh, the, the decision to build entirely a new capacity is a very long horizon decision, and uh, most uh, generation, generating capacity has an expected useful life of at least two decades, and some can be expected to last four decades or even more. Um, whether these, uh, the investment makes sense depends on long-term forecasts about future demand and availability of other capacity. However, uh, other capacity decisions are shorter term decisions, like um, investments uh, can be made to refurbish existing generation capacity and extend its useful life, uh, or it may be possible to significantly increase the capacity of an existing plant by installing new technology that had not been available when it was uh, first built. Um, now, th this uh, everyday maintenance decisions are also capacity decisions because uh, uh, a well-maintained plant is less likely to have unplanned outages so that its availability factor is much higher than a poorly maintained plant. Um, as we discussed earlier, this availability, it is an important uh, dimension of capacity. Uh, if a system happens to have excess capacity, then it may make economic sense to uh, either mothball or retire some of the capacity. Um, now, this, uh, in, in electricity industry, uh, it is important to assure that the system's aggregate capacity is always adequate to serve the load, taking into account the dangers of unplanned generation and transmission outages, as well as the uncertainty about uh, load growth. Um, if there is not enough capacity, then uh, some of the load must be involuntarily interrupted, and this can happen uh, by forced load shedding or, uh, in the worst outcome, through blackouts. Uh, now, as we saw in, uh, in the last session about, uh, about load in, in the EMTP series, the value of lost load, uh, we learned that it is usually uh, very high. And consequently, the systems maintain historical data uh, on lost load, and they analyze forecasted loss of load probability to determine whether a new capacity is required in the system or not. Uh, this table on your screens, uh, it shows an example uh, of uh, the calculation of lost load. 
resulting from inadequate generation or uh, over a short period of uh, uh, just uh, a couple of hours. I think uh, these are around uh, 10 hours. Now we will be solving an example here. Um, now this system has a total capacity of uh, 500 megawatt uh, and uh, the table it shows us uh, the unplanned outages during each hours uh, and therefore the capacity that is actually available to meet um, to meet the load. So uh, in the first part uh, are the number of hours and the second part it, uh, it mentions about the generation capacity and its availability and third is uh, the load. Uh, it also this, this shows the scheduled load in uh, each hour um, and we see from the screen that uh, for 8 out of the 10 hours the available capacity is more than uh, the load that is scheduled. So uh, the load uh, which is scheduled is fully served. However, in uh, 2 of the hours, um, if we see here, uh, the available capacity is uh, less than uh, the load that is scheduled. I think uh, these are the 2 hours. So here we see that uh, the, the uh, available capacity is less. So uh, because of this uh, lower uh, than the scheduled load, cap load capacity, some of the load it must be left unserved and uh, this is the lost load. Uh, we also see that in one of the two hours, the problem is that, um, that the absolute capacity is insufficient to serve the scheduled load. Uh, we are talking about this hour, hour number 15. Uh, and uh, in the other, uh, the problem is that uh, uh, an unscheduled outage on uh, on this uh, generation of 35 uh, megawatt hours, uh, it has caused uh, an inefficiency. So over the short period, uh, the total unserved uh, load uh, that we uh, that we calculate here is around 35 uh, megawatt hours, whereas uh, the total that was scheduled is uh, 44.95 megawatt hours. So this is around 0.8 percent um, in terms of percentage. Uh, now, uh, different countries have different, uh, you can say, uh, matrix for uh, for this unserved load uh, calculations. Like in US, a commonly quoted standard is one day in 10 years, uh, or a much lower figure of 0.027% uh, compared to what we are seeing here uh, of 0.8%. Uh, and how, uh, however, uh, the right target uh, is a value judgment, uh, and historically it has varied. Uh, it and uh, historically, it uh, varies regionally and uh, evolves uh, through time as the society becomes more demanding for uh, the electricity system. Now, uh, in order to ensure uh, resource adequacy, uh, that is, uh, there is sufficient capacity in the system to avoid the loss of load, uh, most systems, they develop uh, planning procedures and mechanisms to, to develop the new capacity uh, is also developed in advance of uh, the growth in load. Uh, systems also take steps to prevent generation from being mothballed or shut down if uh, the capacity uh, needed, if the capacity is needed to assure reliability uh, while new capacity is being built. Uh, and uh, finally, the systems, they also take steps to be sure that the existing generation is well maintained and able to deliver its stated capacity and that uh, the maintenance schedules are staggered appropriately so that enough uh, of the uh, capacity available in the grid is available to serve the load throughout uh, the different times in the year. Um, now let's uh, do a small quiz on this uh, loss load exercise. Um, you, you see the data on your screen. So the question is that in each cell, which is marked with a question mark, you need to determine the load that is served and unserved and the total load of the system served and unserved in this given data set. Uh, and in the hours of unserved load, uh, you also have to tell the reason which caused the deficit in that specific hour. Right, so you have 10 minutes to solve this example and uh, the data set in Excel form is shared in the Google Classrooms. Uh, please take 10 minutes and we'll be back uh, to solve this situation. Right, so I think you would have uh, solved the quiz. Um, the solution we see here is that uh, in all the hours where the available generation was greater than the scheduled load, we were fully able to serve the load. And in the hours where there was a deficit, either because of uh, the generation outage or because of 
uh, the absolute generation capacity being lower than the scheduled load. The system was unable to meet the load in a full level. The system was unable to meet the load to its fullest. And finally, for the total system, we see that 98% of the total load that was demanded, uh, the system was able to serve, and there was a 2% lost load. Uh, continuing this, so we also see that uh, in our number 19, the overall system demand was so for question number two, we see that uh, in our number 19, the overall system demand, it went beyond the total capacity of generation available in the system, the absolute capacity, and as such, there was a 50 megawatts of unserved load. Whereas in our number 20 and 24, um, the, the generation outage, the, or the outage of generation because of certain, and in our number 20 and 24, we see that uh, the generation outage, although in absolute terms there was capacity available in the system, however, because of uh, the unforeseen outage of this generation facility, the system was not able to serve the load fully. Therefore, uh, in the small exercise of the three hours, there was one hour where the capacity was absolutely, there was one hour where the absolute capacity was lower than the scheduled load. And in two hours, the generation outage caused the deficit for the system. Well, in, uh, in this regard, in capacity investment, uh, one of uh, the commonly used metric for evaluating uh, the investment in new technologies or alternative generation technologies uh, is the levelized cost of electricity or uh, LCOI or LCOE. Now, um, uh, given the stream of uh, capital and operating costs incurred over the life of, uh, of a generation facility and the corresponding stream of electricity that it can produce, uh, the LCO is defined as the charge per uh, kilowatt hour of electricity that sets the discounted present value of the revenues equal to the discounted present value of the streams of costs. Um, and this discounting is done uh, using a cost capital appropriate to the project uh, that has been considered. Now, um, LCOE, uh, it, it is the minimum average price that would have to be received per kilowatt hour of electricity in order to uh, cover the costs of producing the power, including the minimum profit required on, on uh, investment. Um, now, given all the other uh, variables constant, uh, as a rule of thumb or generally, it makes sense uh, to invest in generation technologies that have the lowest uh, levelized cost of electricity. However, uh, this needs to be carefully uh, used carefully uh, and with due regard to the source of data and how they are calculated. The level is cost of electricity. It is given uh, by this equation as shown on your screen. And it tells that uh, the left hand side of this equation, it presents uh, as the present value of all the revenues uh, of all the years from zero to T over the life of the project. And the right hand side is the present value of all costs. Therefore, this equation says that uh, the levelized cost of electricity is the price that uh, makes the present value of revenues equal to the present value of costs. Um, let us now discuss uh, about uh, how the portfolio of different type of capacity has determined to meet uh, the load in a given system. Uh, well, in order to determine which type of capacities are most needed, it is necessary to look beyond the simplistic representation of uh, the levelized cost of electricity. Uh, for example, um, uh, how much of the capacity that we are going to procure should be uh, base load capacity and how much of it should be peakers, uh, how much uh, intermediate kind of generation capacities do we need in the system. Base load generation typically requires a lot Base load generation requires uh, a large capital investment but has a lower marginal operating cost, whereas the peakers, they require small capital investment but have a higher marginal operating cost. Uh, base load is economical uh, so long as the capital costs are amortized over many hours of operation, but it is uneconomic if it only operates for a few hours uh, in each year, uh, whereas uh, on the other hand, peakers are more economical if the generation is uh, only going to be operated a few hours uh, each year. Uh, we can apply this basic intuition to a concrete example uh, using the screening curve methodology that we will be uh, doing just now. Um, but before we uh, start and start doing the example, uh, let's just recall that uh, the, the load duration curve that we, that we learned in uh, our session on the load, uh, that typically uh, this is, the, you can say the problem statement is to uh, invest 
uh, in an optimum way to meet the load that varies uh, overall in time. And if we talk about its distribution, so we see that there is a certain uh, quantum of load that is available throughout the year, throughout the year, which is uh, called as the base load. Then there is a certain load which has appears in the system for a significantly large number of hours, but not uh, throughout the year. Uh, that is uh, remarked as the intermediate load. And then there is a certain load, certain hours in the system where the load goes very high. Uh, but uh, those number of the number of hours of those very high load in the system over the year, they are very low. So we need to optimize uh, the investment in generation so that uh, the overall cost is optimized. Uh, and uh, the the investment and operating costs are such that we are able to meet the load that as shown in the figures at, at the minimum possible cost. Uh, now we'll be solving uh, a problem just now and uh, the statement, the problem statement that we, we have in our front is that uh, what are the capacity factor cutoff values for different type of technologies uh, we'll be broadly classifying as base, uh, intermediate and peaker. And what are the choices of the capacity to install to meet a certain load? Now we have on our screens uh, a basic data for solving the example that we are just going to do for this uh, capacity investment uh, problem. This table gives uh, us uh, a data for a hypothetical new Islamabad system. And it shows the cost parameters of uh, three dispatchable generation technologies together with the parameters for um, a linear load duration curve uh, here. Now, uh, using the cost parameters of first two uh, technologies, that is uh, the base load and intermediate, uh, the graphs on the screen, it shows the total cost per megawatt of installed capacity as a function uh, of the number of hours uh, that megawatt of capacity is used to generate power. Now, we call uh, one technology as, uh, as base load, uh, as shown uh, with green line on the screens, and uh, the other one as intermediate. Uh, although the labels uh, here uh, are the results of the analysis. Now on the vertical axis, um, uh, we see that the intercept for the base load technology is uh, 100 and uh, is, uh, is $240,000 uh, per megawatt per year. And this is the annual capital cost of installing one megawatt of this kind of technology. Now if the base load unit uh, does not operate in any hour, uh, this is the cost that uh, that that will be incurred. And the slope of the total cost for the base load technology is uh, uh, with respect to its operating cost, that was $20 uh, per megawatt hour, uh, as we saw in the last uh, table. Uh, and uh, for full load operation, it goes to uh, around this point. Similarly, uh, for the uh, intermediate type of technology, we see that uh, the Y-intercept is uh, $160,000 uh, per megawatt per year. And uh, this is the annual capital cost of uh, investing or building one megawatt of this kind of technology. Uh, so if uh, the intermediate uh, unit, it does not operate uh, in any hour of the year, uh, this is the cost that, that will have to be uh, paid or that will be incurred. Uh, and uh, the slope uh, of the total cost of this uh, this kind of technology intermediate is uh, $35 per megawatt hours. And we see that uh, the two lines, they cross at a point where each of uh, this technology is uh, uh, operating for approximately 5,333 hours per year, um, which, which turns out to be the capacity factor of uh, around 61%. Mm, so um, to the left, uh, where the hours of operation are less than 5,333, the total cost, uh, uh, annual capital cost plus the operating cost uh, for the intermediate technology is lower compared to the uh, cost of the base load technology. Uh, and however, on the right side, uh, on this side of, uh, of uh, this cutoff value, we see that uh, the total of cost, including the operating and uh, um, investment cost of the base load technology is lower than the uh, total cost of intermediate kind of technology. So uh, if we need uh, generation for uh, for at least 5,333 hours of this of the year for this system, it is better to invest in the uh, base load technology. Uh, and, uh, the, the, uh, and in case it is uh, lower than this uh, mark, uh, the, the capacity required 
for the operation is less than 5,333 hours, then we should be better off uh, investing in intermediate kind of technology. So we call this 61% uh, capacity factor as, uh, as the cutoff value for the uh, determination of either the base load or uh, intermediate kind of load technology. Uh, we, we do a similar comparison uh, for, uh, for the peaker technology and the intermediate technology. Uh, and on the screens, we see that uh, the capital cost of peaker technology is uh, $80,000 per megawatt per year, uh, as we have this from the uh, source data. And uh, the slope of this line is with respect to an operating cost of uh, $80 per megawatt hour. Um, now, in this case, we see that uh, both the lines, they cut each other at approximately uh, 1,778 hours. So, uh, per, of, of operation per year, uh, therefore, um, which, which turns out uh, to be a capacity factor of around 20% here. Um, so, uh, to the left, where, where the hours of operation, they are less than 1778 uh, hours per year, the total cost, uh, including the annual capital cost plus the operating cost, is less for peaker kind of technology than for the intermediate technology. And uh, to the right, uh, where the hours of operation, they are more than 1778, uh, the total cost of intermediate technology is lower than the, uh, than, than the uh, peaker technology. So if we need extra generation for uh, the number of hours between 1778 and 5,333, uh, for each year, then uh, it is better to install intermediate kind of technology. Um, uh, and if we need extra generation for fewer hours of the year, then we should be installing a uh, peaker uh, type kind of uh, generation technology because it is cheaper. And uh, this 20% uh, capacity factor uh, is the cutoff value for making a decision between uh, the uh, intermediate and uh, the peaker kind of technology. Now, if we overlay this information uh, of uh, number of hours or cutoff value that we have calculated over the load duration curve based on the data that we saw in the uh, table at the start of this example, uh, uh, this will give us the amount of capacity to install for each type of uh, generation, which is as shown on the screens. Uh, for the purpose of simplicity, uh, in this example, uh, we are using a linear load duration curve, which uh, has uh, a a straight line starting from a max value of 22,000 megawatts uh, for, for all uh, hours of the year. So we see that um, um, so we see that uh, the maximum load on the system is 22,000 megawatts and uh, the minimum load is, sorry, I think I forgot to uh, at the scale here, it is around 10,000 uh, megawatts. So along the horizontal axis, we have marked uh, the point for 5,333 hours. Um, and the LDC for 5,333 hours is uh, around 14,694 megawatt. Uh, therefore, uh, th this is the point that uh, there are 5,333 hours a year when the demand is greater than uh, this number, uh, 14,694. So if we install up to 14,694 megawatts of base load capacity, it can uh, all be operated with uh, at least a capacity factor of around 61%, which was the cutoff value for our uh, base load technology. Uh, and if we install more than uh, this uh, 14,694 of baseload capacity, some of it will have to operate at a capacity factor that is lower than the cutoff value of 61%. Uh, therefore, in that case, uh, when, uh, the, when we move uh, to the load above this point, um, uh, it would be better to install uh, in the intermediate kind of technology. We continue with the same example to determine the quantum of uh, intermediate kind of technology. Um, now the, gra the graph on the screen now, it shows the capacity for the intermediate generation units. Uh, how is it determined? Now here along the horizontal axis, we have uh, marked again uh, the hours of operation in the year. Uh, and we have put a mark on 1778 hours. That was the cutoff value for intermediate kind of technology. Uh, and uh, we have also marked uh, on the horizontal axis for the LDC of 1778, which uh, turns out to be 19,565 megawatt. 
So if we install up to, uh, because we already determined the quantum of base load that was uh, 14,694. So if we add the additional capacity of 4,871 up to 19,565 megawatt, uh, it would be optimum for, uh, so if we install up to this 4,871 megawatt of intermediate capacity on top of the uh, 14,694 that we already determined for the base load, uh, so the combined capacity of 1965 megawatts, uh, the intermediate units, they can all be operated with at least a capacity factor of 20% that was the cutoff value for this kind of technology. Uh, and if you install more than uh, this, this number, that is 4871, some of the capacity from this technology will have to operate at a capacity factor of less than 20%. And in that, that case, uh, it would have been better to have installed a peaker technology uh, capacity for the megawatts above uh, 4871 or cumulative capacity of 19,565 uh, megawatt. Now, uh, for the portion of LDC um, to the left of uh, this 1778, uh, it is more economical to use the peaker technology as we just discussed. Uh, and if we install enough to serve the load in all hours, we need at least 2435 megawatts of uh, peaker technology so that we are able to meet uh, the peak demand of 22,000 megawatts in the system. While the peaker technology is uh, the cheapest solution for a few hours of uh, year when the load is high, but uh, peaking units are still an expensive solution. Uh, now consider what it costs to serve uh, the one hour a year with the highest load, uh, that is the load of 22,000 megawatts. And suppose that we had installed a nerf capacity to serve all of the other hours of the year, but that we leave uh, a small amount of load unserved during this peak hour. This one. Sorry. This one. Now in this case, um, the tables on your screen, it uh, compares the cost of this choice against the cost of our earlier choice to install sufficient capacity to always serve all the load. Um, this, uh, among the alternate uh, capacity choices, the first column, it shows the installed capacity. If we install enough peaker capacity to serve the load uh, fully in all hours, except one hour with the highest load, this column. Here. <clears throat> now during the one hour a year with the highest load, we would have this total capacity of uh, 21,998 megawatts, uh, but uh, we would have a load of 22,000 megawatts because uh, the total load on the system was this much. Now in this case, uh, we would only need a peaker capacity of 2433.94 megawatts. Um, now, uh, how is this calculated? Uh, if you remember with the linear load curve we had uh, for this system, uh, where the load started from 22K and it dropped to uh, 10,000 uh, of minimum. Uh, if we take a linear, uh, with a linear slope of this line, uh, we see that uh, the average load per hour is calculated as uh, with this formula. Uh, it turns out to be 1.37, 1.37 megawatt per hour with this linear slope. So the decrease in peaking capacity, if we uh, if we decide to not serve this megawatt of load, will be uh, reduced by 1.37 megawatt from 2435 to 2433 megawatts. And the energy that would be lost in this process, because again, uh, energy would be the area under the curve if we consider this only one hour, which uh, started from 22K to uh, 21.998 with a reduction of this 1.37 megawatt. The energy that would remain unserved, uh, it turns out to be 0 0.69 megawatt hours. Now, since the value of lost load for this example, when we started uh, with the first table, uh, we set the value of lost load to be $4,000 per megawatt hour, um, with the total cost uh, for this lost load in terms of this energy happening to be uh, $2470 per year. Now, the second column here in this table, it shows uh, how the things change if we add additional peaker capacity to serve the load fully in all hours. 
Um, these are the capacity amounts calculated uh, earlier that we did in the last uh, slide. Now, the uh, in order to fully serve the load in this last hour, uh, we would have to install an extra 1.37 megawatt of peaker capacity. And if you remember, the capital cost uh, for adding uh, the peaking capacity was $80,000 per megawatt per year for each megawatt. So uh, for the uh, for adding an additional 1.37 megawatts, uh, the total cost would be would turn out to be 109 uh, point 109.589 dollars per year will be the additional cost uh, capex for for installing this much quantum of uh, peaker technology and in addition to uh, this uh, investment cost the operating cost of this technology to deliver the energy that we are otherwise say, leaving unserved that is uh, 0.69 megawatt hours for that hour would cost uh, $55 per year at the rate of its uh, production cost now the total incremental cost in this case would be uh, 10 nine six double four dollars for this year now of course the benefit is that uh, we save the cost of lost load but uh, the 27 40 dollars a year uh, cost of the lost load is much much lower than the cost of adding and operating this uh, 1.37 megawatts of additional peaking capacity in the system now if you recall from uh, our uh, uh, calculations of the marginal cost which we learned uh, earlier uh, the marginal cost of serving this last uh, load hour uh, would happen to be approximately around $160,000 per megawatt hour and that is a very expensive price to pay for the last bit of electricity uh, and much higher than the value of lost load now uh, it may make sense so instead to leave a portion of the customer's load unserved a few hours a year thereby saving on the cost of installing the last few megawatts of peaker capacity. Um, now, uh, to, to continue our example uh, of uh, screening curve methodology, uh, figures on the screen, it, it continues with, uh, with the exercise to determine how much peaker capacity to install, taking into account now the value of lost load for the few hours of unserved load. Uh, now this figure compares the cost of serving load with the peaker as a function of the number of hours it generates against the cost of paying the load an amount equal to the value of lost load for each megawatt hour uh, that remains unserved. Uh, the structure of this figure is uh, similar to what we did uh, for, for determining the uh, base load and intermediate kind of technology except that uh, on, on the uh, x axis we are now considering only a very few number of hours that is 100. Um, now if you see the cost of unserved load it starts at uh, 0 and there is no fixed cost uh, and the slope of cost of unserved load it equals the value of lost load uh, which was $4,000 uh, per megawatt hour. As this figure shows now these two lines cross at a point where the peaker is operating approximately uh, 20 hours per year which is a capacity factor of less than 1%. Uh, to the left of this line, uh, again, uh, similar to the, our analysis of uh, last exercise, um, the hours of operation are less than 20.4 20 hours per year, uh, and it is cheaper to leave uh, this much of load unserved uh, and impose on customers a cost uh, equal to the value of lost load for each megawatt hour. Now, continuing this example, uh, to overlay this information on the, uh, on the linearized load duration curve that we saw earlier, uh, we use this information uh, to we identify the amount of peaker capacity that should be installed to meet the load at the minimum possible cost. Now along the horizontal axis we have marked a point of approximately 20.4 hours uh, which was the cutoff value for this kind of technology and the LDC for 20 point uh, and the LDC for 20 hours is 21,972 megawatts. That is, uh, there are 20 hours in a year when the demand is greater than uh, this mark, 21972. So if we install up to uh, 2407 megawatts of uh, peaker kind of technology on top of uh, 19,565 that we determined uh, combined for uh, the base load and intermediate, uh, the total combined capacity of the system would rise to uh, 21,972 megawatts. Uh, and in this case, the peakers can all be operated with at least a capacity factor of 
20 hours that we just determined. Uh, and if we install more than 2407 megawatt of peaker capacity, uh, some of the capacity will have to operate uh, at less than the cutoff value of 20 hours. And in that case, it would have been better to have left uh, that load unserved at a cost of value of lost load. Now, we, uh, we summarize uh, the output of this uh, screening curve uh, exercise uh, of the new Islamabad system which records the capacity factor cutoff values for each technology along with the choice of capacity to install. The choice of capacity also implies a plan for which the combination of generation technology will serve the load, uh, will serve the load duration curve um, as shown here. Now along the vertical axis, we mark uh, of the amount of each type of uh, capacity with the lowest operating cost technology at the bottom and the highest at the top. So uh, 14,694 megawatts of uh, base load type capacity and uh, the additional around 4,000 megawatts of uh, intermediate type of generation technology to mark a total of 19,565 and 2407 megawatts of uh, the peaker capacity which brings the total capacity equal to uh, 21972 megawatt uh, while leaving uh, this one hour of load unserved. 2407. Now, uh, the lowest operating cost technology is always the first one to be used to serve the load. Um, and so, as the figure shows, that uh, we can move across the hours and define the region served by each technology. Uh, summarizing again our example in a tabular form. Um, uh, we, we show the capital cost of the selected capacities and operating cost for the resulting generation and the total cost for this uh, our uh, hypothetical new Islamabad example. The screening of exercise, it took as inputs the information um, in, in the base table, uh, including both uh, the uh, profile of costs for different generation technologies and the description of load uh, the, where we defined the load duration curve and the value of loss load. Uh, and this exercise produces as an output the profile of capacity installed for each technology uh, as shown on your screens. Uh, this exercise designated to find the profile of capacities that uh, minimizes total cost uh, including both capital and operating cost and the resulting total cost including the cost of demand management or uh, the unserved load to say otherwise. Uh, and it shows the lowest possible cost to meet uh, the, the demand of uh, 22,000 megawatt system. Uh, now, this simple example that we constructed, uh, it uh, illustrates the trade-off in choosing between alternative generation technologies uh, and focusing only on one differentiating characteristic. That was the combination of capital and operating cost. There are many other characteristics uh, that a system operator must consider or the planners they, they must consider. For example, there are a few hours each year when the system may demand uh, extremely high ramping capabilities. Uh, the system operators will want to have some uh, generators uh, with, uh, with that specific capability to meet uh, the, the uh, ramping requirements. Uh, and even if they are not uh, the cheapest generators uh, to use them for, for the rest of the hours. Fortunately, uh, there are many different generation technologies that we uh, we we uh, had a recap uh, today as well, uh, with many different operating characteristics, uh, and uh, it makes it possible for the systems to employ a portfolio of technologies uh, that, taken together, covers uh, all of the system's needs at a relatively uh, low total cost. Um, but in principle, this more complex portfolio problem is similar to the simpler version we we just. Uh, uh, exercised here. Uh, however, uh, you can see that uh, as we incorporate additional characteristics, the problem uh, quickly becomes very complex. Uh, this simple example also focused uh, exclusively on dispatchable generation technologies. Uh, incorporating renewables, uh, they make the problem more complex because of the intermittency of the resource uh, and of the resources available when the load is highest. Uh, some solar PV and certain offshore wind resources, uh, sometimes then uh, uh, it makes sense to install more of that capacity uh, and uh, offset certain thermal capacity requirements. And if the resource is uh, most plentiful when the load is lowest, uh, 
uh, then it makes sense to install less of the renewable capacities and uh, rely more on dispatchable technologies. Uh, a proper determination of the optimal mix of capacity uh, involves a calculation like uh, the one uh, we, we did in our simple example, but the calculations are more extensive and complex. Uh, this example also displays only a single scenario for load. Uh, it, uh, it does not show the LDC for a year when the load is high, nor for the year when the load is low. This variability is also important as uh, the uncertainty about uh, the future load. Uh, the capacity investment decisions uh, also have a lead time. So for some technologies such as uh, nuclear or hydel, uh, the lead time is more than uh, around a decade or even more. And for other such as say VREs, uh, wind and solar, uh, it, it is now a matter of uh, a few years. Uh, but in all cases, investments are made based on the forecasts of the load. By the time uh, capacity has been installed, uh, the actual load on the system may be different from the forecast. But uh, but uh, the example we did and the table uh, that is on, on your screens, it, it shows the amount of generation only if the actual uh, load happens as we, we uh, determined or we forecasted 22,000 megawatts. Uh, but if the LDC is higher or lower than the forecast, then the profile of generation will be different uh, as, uh, and, and also uh, the operating costs will also be incurred. This certainty makes the portfolio decision more complex than what we did in our example. Therefore, for this purpose, um, typically the operators or the planners, they use uh, complex mathematical models and tools uh, which can incorporate all kind of uh, uncertainties and the variables to cater for uh, what, what can happen in the power system. Uh, and then they come up with a solution for uh, determining the portfolio of capacity in the system. So uh, with this, I thank you all for your time. Uh, and, uh, and if you have any questions, you are most welcome to post them in, in the chat box.